I've known the EMU since back in the early 50s. I've seen it go through many changes. You walk in there and it still brings memories back. There was always something happening in there. You're engulfed by that warmth of friendship and camaraderie. When I got to campus, it was the first place I went as a freshman, looking to get involved. It was sort of like the center of a wheel, you know, where all the spokes are coming together. Anytime I walk into the fishbowl, I think, if only they knew, if only these students all knew what took place here. The Herb Memorial Union, the University of Oregon Student Union. This is not just the story of how a building came to be. This is the story of the EMU and how it became more than just a building. The 1920s, the University of Oregon was nearing its 50th anniversary. Student unions began to appear on campuses across the nation, functioning as places students could go outside of class to relax and socialize. But the University of Oregon had no such place. Student body president John McGregor had taken note of new student unions opening on other college campuses. McGregor affirmed that the U of O desperately needed such a building. When the first building, as a matter of fact, was built, there was no place for a student to sit down during the first two years. So instead, they stood out in the hallway or sat on the floor in the hallway waiting for their class to start. The class of 1925 would raise more money than any other class. Their effort brought the total amount raised to $219,000 and the dream of a student union closer to reality. But the university's need for a library, science building, and more classrooms outweighed that for a student union bringing the student union drive to a standstill. On March 1, 1938, the State Board of Higher Education hired Donald Erb to be its seventh president. With the full support of their young president, students reawakened the campaign for a student union. Donald Erb was a, one of the really good guy presidents of the University of Oregon. He was a perfect choice for the university at that time. He was renowned for already for being a truly ethical person. In December of 1943, Donald Erb fell seriously ill with pneumonia. Doctors were unable to save him. His sudden death shocked the campus, state, and national academic community. Just 43 years old, Erb left behind a university filled with sadness and disbelief. With new determination, the students of the University of Oregon would endeavor to give President Erb the legacy he deserved. Fall term of 1945 saw enrollment increase by 104% from the year before. By the end of the school year, veterans accounted for more than half of the student population, but there was still little refuge for students between classes. They were forced to stand around outside, crowding the campus streets and pathways and spilling onto the lawns. By 1946, enough money had been raised to allow for the completion of the union's preliminary plans. On September 17, 1950, the student union was finally open. The new building would serve not only as a memorial to fallen war veterans, but as a memorial to Donald Erb. It was one of the finest, most modern student union buildings in the nation. The new student union, or SU as they would come to call it, was an instant hit with students. Downstairs, students could play pool or ping pong. They could even go bowling. It was an absolutely beautiful building when it was was built and it was immediately used by the students. It was welcomed, it was wanted, and it was filled. By the end of the 1966 school year, as pictures and coverage of the Vietnam War became more public, student protesting increased. Our major objective is to bring attention to the campus on military involvement in campus affairs. The second goal is to, of course, protest the draft and the war in Vietnam. We're all hopeful that the Paris talks will be successful, that they will lead to serious negotiations and bring an end to the destruction and the killing. Everyone on campus on certain nights would be gathered around the closest TV to see if their friends were going to have their number pulled to be drafted. The class of 1968 erected a freedom of speech platform at the main entryway of the EMU, 
Students, faculty, and community members would swarm the courtyard outside the fishbowl, sometimes by the thousands, to hear guest lecturers, to speak out about civil rights and Vietnam, and to support the Poor People's Movement for economic and human rights. On November 22, 1963, George was driving home to visit family. I saw cars all over, pulling over people crying. I thought, I can't go on home, so I turned around, came back into town, and I drove up, and I parked, and went inside the EMU. It was packed, loaded with people. There was a radio on. A rather rifle. Three loud bursts of gunfire, possible tragedy on this November 22nd in Big D. The President of the United States is dead. He died at 1 o'clock this afternoon in Parkland Hospital 45 minutes ago. Shot to death, as we've told you, by an assassin in the streets of Dallas. The whole fishbowl just quiet. A stunning moment, I'll always remember it. By the end of the 1960s, the use of the EMU was beyond its capacity. The student population had more than doubled since the EMU first opened. In 1972, the EMU underwent a major expansion, adding more than 54,000 square feet to the southeast side of the building. The addition, completed in 1975, included an arts and crafts center, student offices, meeting rooms, dining facilities, and student lounges. That year, Adele McMillan was hired as the EMU's fourth director. It was under Adele's tenure that most of the EMU programs as we know them today were created. The new programs would coincide with the growth of feminism, environmentalism, and rising counterculture. Nowhere did these ideals come together more vividly than with the outdoor program. There was kind of a rise in, in interest about um, protesting the degradation of the environment. It was a big player in, in getting students involved with the outdoor program. Another new program, Club Sports, offered female students greater opportunities to participate in competitive sports. But the first thing I wanted to do was open it up and make it a very available to U of O women. The change was more than just an opportunity for more women to compete. For some students, such as Anne Bancroft, who would go on to be the first female explorer to cross ice into the North Pole, participating in team sports was a critical part of their student experience. If I quit the field hockey team, I probably will drop out of school. I mean, it's, the th you know, it's, I, I need it. In 1968, the Black Student Union became the first student union to be recognized by the ASUO, and was given a meeting space in the EMU. The need for cultural identity and the need for cultural basis to operate from, the need for, for a more pluralistic uh, uh, program in the university that recognizes that white people are not the only people that existed in this country and that have helped develop this country. The Native American Student Union would become the second student union recognized by the ASUO. When you've been an Indian all your life and knew you were an Indian, but you didn't have an official organization out to which you belonged, and you knew you were, that was suddenly, you were bursting wide open. You, like, you were filled with, oh my God, we're, we are. Might not seem like much, but it was pretty amazing. In November 2012, as they had done almost a century earlier, U of O students voted to increase their fees to revitalize and modernize their student union, scheduled to open fall 2016, and will add 80,000 square feet of new space, including a student resource center, expanded food and retail spaces, a three-story atrium, and, some 40 years after students first requested it, a pub. <laughs>